Okay. Um, so yeah, so this week uh, we're talking about is the last week. Um, tears, <laughs> sad, sad times, but uh, um, but yeah, it was pretty interesting. Something I'm, I look forward to for a little bit with this uh, C plus plus stuff. Um, I tried to learn as much as I could about C plus plus. In the meantime, like like since I started reading this chapter, watch a few videos, but I'm still really bad at it. Um, so hopefully, you know, it's kind of an incremental improvement process, I think. But um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the chapter, about some of the basic kind of building blocks, and then um, and then show an example uh, that I did where I compiled some C like uh, code using the source C++ function and benchmarked it and it was really slow, but I tried. Um, anyway, all right, so let's go into this. So in the previous weeks, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about improving performance. We talked about uh, strategies of organization, vectorization, and avoiding copies. The weeks before that, uh, we talked about measuring performance using like profiling or uh, yeah, using profiling and also um, like benchmarking. And then um, and then the week before we talked about uh, in the first chapter in the section uh, debugging with uh, tools like uh, browser. And so this week kind of builds on that improving performance uh, section. Um, with uh, talking about C++. And so that's kind of the, the last big strategy, I guess, that uh, Hadley has in this book to making your code faster. Um, and before I go into it, uh, I looked at a bunch of resources and watched some videos before doing this, um, trying to learn a little bit about C++. And so some ones I found helpful uh, were this, was this RCP for everyone resource. Um, I'll put the link in Slack later. I think I put it actually early, uh, a few weeks, a week ago in the advanced star uh, thread, but I'll share that. And there's this free code camp uh, series of videos that I thought was really good. Um, I just want to go quickly to um, this art. Oh, where is it? Okay. Um, so basically, uh, actually, before I go in there, uh, RC, RC++, RCPP, um, is both a, uh, a library for um, kind of bringing C++ functions and source code into R, um, but it's also a C++ like module for, for bringing in R-like functions to C++. So you can use it to both uh, write uh, kind of R like code in some ways in C and also compile C code and bring it into R. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so for the R, for RCPP, uh, RC, uh, there's this really nice uh, book, uh, or book down book, I guess, called uh, RCP for Everyone. Uh, I used it a lot when I was re re referenced it when I was trying to create my example. Um, and so I'm not going to go into it uh, that deeply, but like uh, I used, like I was dealing with vectors a lot and um, I thought it was some really good documentation on like how to create like numeric vectors as well as all the methods. So then they call them like member functions that you can call on, on a numeric vector object, like sorting, um, like uh, so, pushing is would be is like appending um, to either the front or the back of the of the list, um, and I use that in my uh, function that I'll show you later. Um, and yeah, so like it just has a really a lot of really nice stuff. Like uh, you know, you can in with RC uh, RC plus plus, you can create like data frames in C plus plus or something that acts like a data frame. Um, and when you bring it back out into R, uh, you, know, uh, you can have columns of, you know, of vectors and things like that. So anyway, uh, I rec recommend checking it out. Um, and, then, um, and then the other thing uh, that I want to show is this, where is it? So I, I did this series, uh, I was just looking at Free Code Camp and they had this really nice uh, video course that goes into a lot of, concepts in C++, um, 
I watched these and I thought I understood it, but now I don't remember what some of these are. Um, but, uh, but it's, yeah, it's just a really nice uh, kind of overview of some of the basic principles and things that people do in C++. Um, that, uh, and, and, and there's also, she also has some videos on like pointers and like memory uh, stuff that's pretty interesting. Um, so anyway, recommend checking that out. Um, back to this. So this is straight from the chapter, but um, uh, Hadley kind of mentions a few situations that you want to start, you might want to think about using C++, excuse me. Um, so, so one case is loops that can't easily be vectorized. Um, and, and so like when you, so, so, so in R, if you can vectorize something, it's going to be pretty fast as you guys know. Um, uh, but then also like, like if you use something like map, uh, you can't, uh, unless you use a different, like, like accumulate or something in per, if you use map, you can't, uh, kind of reference previous values. And so I get, that's a case where if you have a situation like that, uh, you might want to use a C++ loop, uh, also recursive functions. Uh, I don't use recursive functions much in my code, at least not right now, but if you do, uh, it's, it's a lot faster C++. Um, and then lastly, uh, there's a standard temp template library that C++ offers. Um, and there's, it's a lot of, has a lot of data structures that you don't really have in R, um, that you have in a lot of other languages, um, like uh, Dex and Qs and um, uh, like linked lists and all these different kind of computer science -y objects. Um, uh, so I, as of right now, I, I, I guess I don't know enough about those types of objects to know where I would want to use them in my code, but, you know, I think it's good to know that they're there. Um, okay. So, oh, this is another resource I forgot to, I think Hadley references this one, but I'll just quickly go to it. Uh, it looks kind of outdated, but, uh, but it actually is pretty good for kind of getting started in C++. Um, and so I just wanted to reference that. And they talk about the differences between kind of languages that are compiled languages and languages like R that are interpreted. Um, and uh, so basically in a, in a language like C++, uh, you have some source code that you're writing uh, and then it gets compiled. It produces a executable, uh, just like a program that can be run on its own. Um, and then it's run on some hardware and produces some results. In a language like R, uh, you have this high level code that you write in a script, it's interpreted by R and then it's run. And, and, the, and the, the upside of something of a language like R is that you uh, can like kind of code interactively and just like run things over like one at a time and, and you don't have to compile a whole program. Um, but the downside of that is that it makes it slower uh, in a lot of cases uh, because every single time you call the code, you have to interpret it. Um, so, so yeah, so just kind of an overview of the differences from a high level with C++ and R. Um, and then, yeah, and so getting into uh, uh, the C++ uh, RC PP package. Um, so you can use this CPP function um, basically to write C, a C++ function um, in your R session and uh, it'll just uh, compile on its own. So you don't need to do anything fancy or any extra compiling. It'll do that kind of in the background. Um, and you just supply it, uh, you know, a string that's uh, C++ code. And then you'll see this, the whatever function you make uh, in the environment. And so I think this also shows some, you know, slight differences in how C++ and R uh, are, are syntactic, syntactically like constructed. So with C++, you always uh, have to specify the return type of your function. So in this case, it's an integer that's being returned. Uh, this is gonna be the name of your function. So in this case, it's add. And then for each uh, argument, you specify the type of that uh, as well. Um, so this is something that obviously you don't do in R, um, but a lot of other languages you do. And C++ is one of them. And then, uh, and then so the same thing, if you're defining like a variable here, which is sum in this case, you have to specify the type. 
Um, and then every line will end with a, a semicolon. The, every kind of a statement, I guess, ends with a semicolon. And then once you compile it and you run this, uh, you don't need to assign it to anything or anything like that. It'll just kind of appear uh, in your, it'll be in your environment. Um, and then, and then you just, you just call it like any other uh, function. So in this case, you know, you just call add and one, two, three, and it equals six and just works right out of the box in, in, in the session. Uh, sorry for the code highlighting here. It's like, I guess it doesn't understand that this is a continuous string here. Um, okay. And if anyone has any questions or anything they'd like to talk about, just feel free to interrupt or ask. Um, Okay, uh, so then it goes through a bunch of different types of examples. So this one is like, you're not really, you're not actually inputting anything and you're getting some kind of scalar output. So in this case, like in an integer. Um, so this is a really basic function, you know, with in R you would, it's just returning the uh, integer one. Um, and then if you wanted to do it on the C, you just specify your return type, name the function, say what you want to return, and it does the same thing. Um, and just for fun, I uh, just uh, benchmarked all these examples. Um, so in this case, um, in a, a lot of these early cases, um, C is actually slower. Um, I get confused all the time between these, these different uh, types here, but I think this is nanoseconds uh, and this is uh, milliseconds. Is, I think I'm right, that's correct. Um, so this, so this first one is uh, the R version is faster, I believe, right? So yeah. Double, so double the, check. Um, micro is sorry. Go micro ahead. is yeah. ten to the minus sixth. Yeah. And nano is ten to the minus ninth. Okay. So nano is quicker than micro. Got it. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, and you can also see that in the uh, iterations per second um, over there. So just interesting, uh, yeah, but um, I think the tough thing for comparing uh, some of these functions that are being created here is that like it's hard to know just from looking at this how much of the underlying R code is actually written in C++ as well. So um, yeah, I think in a lot of cases that there's C++ code underneath. So uh, it makes it kind of hard to compare. Um, Sorry, the bottom here got cut off. But um, here's another example with like scalar input and scalar output. Um, so uh, in this case, uh, this is just a function that returns the sign uh, of of the number you uh, enter. So um, so if you enter a positive number, uh, it'll return one, zero will return zero, and negative number will return negative one. So in this case, enter negative 12. Um, the C++ function Again, it actually looks a lot like R in this case, you know, so you have brackets defining um, kind of the, the, uh, the body of your function, some if else statements, uh, and, you know, in this case, it really looks exactly like R in that case, um, just with the semicolons at the end of your syntax there, or your met of your, uh, of your uh, call or statement, or I don't know the right word for it, but, um, and yeah, so I did the same thing here, uh, benchmarked them. And uh, again, the R function is uh, it's considerably faster, although we're talking about like nanoseconds and micro microseconds, right? Uh, microseconds and, uh, you know, if, unless you're doing a, a very large number of iterations, you probably wouldn't notice it. Um, okay, and then um, talks about example an example where you're uh, inputting uh, a vector and you get a scalar in return. Um, so I just kind of made up a vector here, um, numeric vector, and um, uh, I actually forgot what this is here. So it's okay. So it's looping through the list and just kind of adding up uh, the total of of oh some yeah some are so it's adding up the total of all the values in the vector. Um, and then this C++ function does the same thing. Uh, so again, I'm returning double. I'm calling the function sum C. Um, I'm uh, saying that there's going to be a numeric vector that's an argument. Um, and that's actually, uh, uh, this is a, a C++ like type. Uh, so it's, this is the, this is where you see 
kind of the C++, the RC++ uh, module in C++ code, um, which is interesting. And then, um, and then uh, yeah, so then you have C++ methods to get the length or the size of, of that vector. Um, you know, doing the same thing uh, for, so for loops look a little bit different in C++ as well. So here you're kind of defining your index or your iterator. Um, C++ is uh, a zero index. So the first element is going to be uh, zero. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and then you're going to, you're going to iterate up until uh, basically the last element, which if you're indexing it, it'll be one minus the, um, the, the size because it starts at zero and then this just um, uh, advances the, the index by one each time. Um, and this is actually, you can do this in similar to Python here where you, uh, this plus equals will, is the same thing as saying total equals total plus um, uh, this, this value here in the vector. Um, but instead of writing all that, you just you just can write a shortcut total plus equals um, x and the index, and then it just returns the value of that uh, sum. So again, doing some benchmarking, um, R is still a little faster here, um, but if you actually use the vectorized sum function, um, uh, sorry that's uh, way faster um, so than, than other, other option. Um, so, uh, and uh, it goes back to my point that like, I, I think something like sum, uh, the, the, the vectorized stuff that's really fast, I would guess is really the base R, like is actually written in C++, but I haven't checked the source code, um, but, but yeah. On. Um, so this is uh, kind of a special uh, distance uh, function as an example here. So we're doing vector input and vector output. Um, uh, I forget the actual name of this type of distance function. One second. Um, uh, oh, it's just Euclid Euclidean distance. Okay. Um, sorry. So basically you have some kind of a um, you know, scalar value and you're calculating the, the distance um, uh, to that value from every value in like a vector. Um, and so here, uh, this is already, uh, so I'm, uh, in this example where I'm calling uh, P dist R, I'm using this vector that I defined in the previous example here. Um, and it's already vectorized in R, right? So like I'm not doing a loop through the vector um, or just uh, looking at the distance between each value and the vector and, and the scalar um, and then and then squaring, squaring it and then taking the square root. Um, and so this is the results. You get the same thing here in C++, uh, just a few differences. So like uh, in order to raise something to a certain uh, exponent, you need to use this power function. Um, so in this case, we're, we're squaring it. So raising it, the second argument is two. Um, and then everything else looks similar, except for what we saw in the last example with these four loops. Uh, so again, where you start, where you go until, and then how you advance in the loop. Um, and again, you see here this RCC, R C++ numeric vector type. Um, and this is just syntax here is, is making a numeric vector called out with a length n, which is the size of, of the vector. Um, okay, and then again, doing this benchmarking, still this uh, R1 is faster, um, but if you uh, do a really long vector, um, so did I actually include that here? I guess not. Um, so the, I made a really long, I just repeated this shorter vector. Um, I think it was like 50,000 times or something. Um, and so you start to see, see kind of uh, uh, starting to be a little bit more efficient uh, when you, 
when you include like a more data or like a longer um, object that you're passing to it. Okay, and then um, and then the last kind of major thing is that instead of calling um, kind of these C inline like C++ function um, calls here and just doing one function at a time, only a little piece of code, you can actually create a C++ uh, file with an extension C CPP. Um, and, um, and you can call that using the source uh, C++ um, function from the RC PP package and with a little bit extra syntax, which I'll show in a second in my example, um, you can make something that you can then read into R and basically, you know, call, uh, execute the whole script and compile the whole script. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get into that now. So I'll stop sharing um, and then go into my R studio. Does anyone have any questions or anything so far? Uh, you're doing a good job. Thanks. Okay, cool. But yeah, feel free to ask away if anything comes up. Um, all right, so I'm in my uh, R session here. Um, so the first thing that I realized I didn't know until doing this is that if you do a new file in R, um, in R Studio, you can actually create a C++ file. Um, and so in the last slide I showed in the chapter, Hadley mentions like a few pieces of uh, syntax that you have to have uh, in order for this to be able to be called from within an R session. Um, and that actually is already like populated here. And it's, it's you know, a lot like a lot of the other default files in R Studio, which is nice. So you see this uh, syntax here where if you call a, a function that's a C function, you want to use it in a um, RCC, R, in an R session uh, through this RCC, oh man, I keep on messing up, RC, RC++ uh, source function, you're gonna have to put, put this export uh, syntax in front of it. Um, and I learned this kind of the hard way, but if you, if you have other C code here, um, like, I don't know, I'm probably not gonna write this correctly, but I don't know, if you're making another numeric vector, um, called in or called uh, uh, um, test or whatever. And then you, you have this, this syntax up here. Um, it won't work. Like you need it right before the actual function that you're importing. Um, at least that's what happened to me. Um, one thing to note uh, too about like of C++ is that some of these like import statements look a lot like um, you know, it refers to namespaces and um, you have these include statements. So it, it, in some ways it looks like, in my mind, it looks, it looks a little bit like R um, in that way. And then the, the other neat thing about this is that you can actually run R code in this C++ um, script. So if you, uh, so if I was like in my session and I like, uh, and I won't do it right here, but um, just to show, so, and I called like that script, uh, whatever test at C++, the result will actually call this stuff and also um, the, the R code as well. And you'll get the results right in your R session, which is, can be helpful. Um, okay, so now I'll go into this example, a little toy example I created. So basically um, I was saying at the beginning, uh, I've had a lot of cases where uh, I've used a nest and it's been really slow. Um, so you, and generally if you haven't used a nest, um, it, it's helpful if you have like a nested uh, data frame. So I just created one um, just to show this, but basically um, I created like two time intervals. Uh, so between a time, um, the current time and uh, the, Oh, sorry, the, the current time three weeks ago and the current time two weeks ago and the current time two weeks ago. And now um, just to be able to have two intervals that I could like sample from to make like uh, kind of random sequences of time for this example. Um, and so I just make that here. Uh, it's length 100,000 or uh, yeah, 100,000. Um, just takes a second to make. And so if I were to just look at one of these elements to see, kind of see 
what this looks like. Oops. So if I did this. Um, so this is just the first element. So like I, I did it by minute, so it's or by hour. So some of these could be pretty, pretty long. Um, like this, so it's just you know, a bunch of sequences of time. Um, so if I did another one, so they're they're all like kind of different lengths too. Um, so etc. So you kind of get the idea. Um, and so originally I wanted to do a nest with this. So like, uh, just quickly show you, um, this is how I'd like you would call a nest here. Um, so if I wanted to, so this way um, it'll make it long uh, so that there's one row for each value in each of these lists and it'll duplicate the other columns. Um, so if I just do this, it'll take, I think it takes like 30 seconds or something. That wasn't so bad. Um, so yeah, so you see that it's duplicated this index, and then it'll it has uh, you know the time all the timestamps laid out for you. So it's useful if you're dealing with like time intervals, especially. That's where I've used it a bunch. Um, anyway, so I was thinking maybe I could make a, a nest function that's like faster, just faster, comparable. Um, so I tried to go ahead and do that. Um, so um, uh, that's not, is it the, sorry, I just want to make sure I have the right one open here. There we go. Okay, um, so just like the example, I kept on a lot of the template stuff uh, using namespace R C++. Um, I initialize uh, like a numeric vector. Um, so again, like this is a coming from the RC, RC++ module. And so this is now in C code, C++ code. Uh, I just make an empty uh, numeric vector. Um, this is the final vector that I want to return. And then I'm going to try to go through, basically loop through each element and then uh, append all the stuff in each uh, row to a, a big vector that I'll return at the end. Um, and so I just uh, have this list uh, as an argument. Um, I'm calling it unlist uh, C. Uh, it's returning a numeric vector uh, from this R C++ library. And then, um, and yeah, so I start off by figuring out, you know, how many times you need to iterate, so how many elements are in this list. Um, and then uh, again, like the examples you saw in the book, like start at zero, um, uh, go until uh, basically the index is one minus uh, or one less than the length, and then iterate, uh, index increment by one. Um, and so then in each, so each element of this list, uh, you know, this data frame column that originally um, uh, was, a, was a vector, right? a numeric vector. So, so as I'm indexing, I'm just saying, okay, this is the current vector, it's a numeric vector. Um, uh, and then, and then, uh, and maybe this is a super naive way to do this, but I'm not good at C++, so this is what I did. Um, I then said, okay, for this numeric vector, how big is it? And then I'm going to do another loop inside of that numeric vector. Um, and so I have uh, starting at just kind of different indexes here, just to keep them separate, but starting at zero, again, same thing. And then um, I'm using one of the methods here that I don't know if I think I mentioned when I was showing the RC++ uh, book uh, a second ago, but there's this function or this method called pushback. So it'll just uh, add kind of in place. Uh, so you don't have to like reassign or anything. It's just kind of modifying the vector as an object. Um, uh, just add the last, you know, to the end of the end of this vector, um, whatever the current vector element is and just do that for every element in the vector. And then the very end when I've looped through the whole list and looped through all the elements, in each row, uh, just returning the final vector. So, so, and then I realized after writing this, it wasn't really unnesting. It was just kind of unlisting and, and probably a way that wasn't super efficient, but, and then I'll show you guys the result. So basically, uh, the, so I'm used, so because I have it in a C++ script, I'm using source C++, uh, I put it in our presentation folder, and then I'm just calling it like, you know, like you would kind of source the regular source R function. 
Um, so there it's in, in here, it's compiled, it's ready to go. And then I'm gonna benchmark against unlist. So I'm just gonna do it with the first 10 elements because I, I did it with the whole list for the C version and it uh, froze my session, so. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. So it's like, I don't know, 40,000 times slower. Um, but uh, but yeah, but it works. And I thought it was kind of neat to go from start to end. Um, for some reason, they're not equivalent. So maybe I'm doing something wrong and uh, how I'm returning or maybe the order is slightly different. I'm not really sure. So I had to put this check false in there. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, what do you all think of that? Or, uh, do you have any questions at this point? I was just happy to get something working in R that was C++. Yeah, a lot further than I would have. So it's, cool, it's cool to see. Thanks. Yeah. yeah I, I appreciate you keeping the examples fairly simple, but I was still, still you know, having trouble parsing exactly what's going on, but the benchmarks are really useful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think the simplicity of the examples is also where I am with, uh, you know, learning how to use C++ and um, trying to make it, you know, figure out where to use it. Um, but, but yeah, it's so, interesting. Oh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. No, no, finish. I was just gonna say that uh, the, the one of the things I was thinking about after uh, playing around with this was like like how how much of the time when people who use r are doing stuff in c++ and they want to use it back in r um are are using r c p p heavily uh and like how often are they using um c++ because like i just it, it's weird to me like like I guess RCPP is like super, it's efficient and fast and it's a good thing to use. And it's like, has a lot of like things like data frames and different objects that you wouldn't normally get in C++, but it's like this weird, like intermediate, like it's not R, it's not really C++, although like is a module or, you know, a library or whatever. Um, I don't know. And like, like there's a ton of documentation out there for C++ um, and there's some, for, for R, C++, but like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just like felt weird about, you know, doing this kind of mishmash of, of two different languages in one, um, so. But R Studio has really been touting how friendly their products are for, for having, um, you know, your code be a little more language, language agnostic. Um, they're gonna, mm -hmm. And a markdown, you can put JavaScript and CSS and Python all on there. Um, I'm curious if you can put, um, so, so you know, uh, yeah, when you're in your R markdown, you've got the curly brace R all throughout. Mm -hmm. um, you could put CSS in there. You could put, uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if, he's, that one, I don't know if it works. Um, yeah, let's try it. Uh, but yeah, you could put Python in there. Um, so. That, that's interesting to, to see. Um, yeah, and I think you would just write it like regular uh, C++ code. I did read this chapter uh, quite a while ago. Um, so I apologize if it was very clearly stated in the chapter, but it looked like when you were doing your benchmarking, did it, uh, what did it do? Sorry, oh yeah, uh, I did something weird. I don't know what that means. Uh, did you hit the play button or I just did it a keyboard shortcut, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it doesn't seem right. I don't know. It might be like RC plus plus, or it might, it might be like C actual plus plus. Like, I don't know how they, um, want you to. Ooh. Unknown type. Okay. It did something. Do I have to make it lowercase? Oh, that looks like it worked. All right, let's see. Wait, uh, test plus five. Oh, God. Doesn't like that. Does it need the, the uh, semicolon oh, uh, at the end? You're right. Yeah, it's definitely. Yeah. 
still unknown type. Hmm. I don't know. All right. Well, regardless, um, yeah, there might there might just be a, another way to uh, to do it, or maybe it's not able to do it. But um, uh, so my question was, it looked like in your benchmarking, the garbage collection was very different from uh, between the R version and the the C the C plus plus version. And so I was curious. It looked like the garbage collection is maybe what was tying it up when the when the n was small, or like when the when it was like just iterating over a small amount, but then when mm. it was iterating over a large amount, the garbage collection really helped out. So I, I don't know. Did they talk about that? I, I can't recall. I don't remember that, but maybe others do. Um, so you're talking about my numeric, like my long vector example. Well, uh, if you if you go to your presentation, um, like. Uh, I don't know if you still have it on the in the browser or. Uh, like here, I'll, I can just find it in here. Um, yeah, like this here. Yeah, maybe if you can make that uh, that wider so that we can see the last couple columns. Yeah, so some of them. So this is garbage collection per second. Is that what it means? Or go? Yeah, I, it wasn't on all of them, but there was a couple of them. Um, do, do you still have the presentation in your browser, or? Yeah. Um, here. Let me let me just share my full screen so it's easier. Ah, you're sharing like screen screen by screen. I see. Um, yeah. Um, here we go. This one. Mm, so like in the bottom, the long vector is. Is this one that? Yeah, so this that one, the garbage collection per second is like 20. That means it happened like 21 times per second. Um, mm. And then for the R, it was 18. But then if you go to, uh, could you go back a couple slides? Yeah, so oh, yeah, yeah, here, here, here. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm curious if the garbage collection is part of what ties it up when it's smaller, but then. Uh, adds a lot of savings when it's a, a longer vector. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was just curious about that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, maybe we could do a quick quick test just to um, see. Let's see. Um, here, let me go back into my... Uh, I don't know, maybe I can't do this on the fly here. Uh, so let me see. Somewhere. Here, let me just run everything for a second. All right. Uh, so like, um, let's see. Sorry, it was the sum example, right? That you're talking about? Um, I think so. I think it threw an error at the bottom and stopped running. Oh, it did. Uh, oh, it had this my source. Oh, I, it, was, it was what I did for the, the example that I was showing you guys. Okay. I see. Seven. So you kind of see when you first compile it, it, it takes a second. Uh, but then after that, it's fast. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so we're saying if we make like the vector longer, um, let's see. Is a, okay, I'm trying to think about, uh, let's see. All right, I'm just gonna quickly.
I'm like floored by this, uh, what you're doing right now. Oh, why? Uh, using Matt, uh, Matt DFR to, uh, to go through them all. It's, it's very, very slick. I don't know. I thought like when, I was, when you were saying that, that it might work. And uh, thanks. kind of nerve-wracking to do this live but yeah i bet <laughs> trying but trying to great. pull pull something out thanks and then maybe you could just pull out the uh, uh i was gonna just pull out a garbage collection it would be interesting to see all all, all of them okay so just I'll do that uh Oops. Mm -hmm. One more. All right, let's see. Oh, maybe I want a uh, lot of, I might not know which one's which. Um, mm, interesting. Well, what, what does it, what does it have? Maybe we can. Uh, yeah, let's see here, results. Yeah, so I guess it's in order, so we will know which one is which, right? Um, not sure what this last column's doing. I have no idea. <laughs> um, so what did we okay. ask? We said go 10, 100,000, 10,000? Uh, no, way to let's see. Yeah, 10, 100,000, 10,000, okay. Um, sorry, my, that's like kind of frozen. All right. Yeah, so I could see. So this last one, C. Um, oh, it's actually okay. So so here in this first one, R the base R sum is like twice as fast, um, and it's still like twice as fast, still twice as fast, and then like all the way up here. This is 406 milliseconds and this is 443. So they're kind of like closing. Um, but it's where the, the garbage collection isn't like, like it doesn't seem like it was as high as it was in the example that we saw before. I guess that was with the short vector, right? Maybe because it only ran for half a second or? Yeah, you're running less iterations in the first one, right? Because you're hitting the iteration limit, not the time limit. Hmm. Like the total time never even hits a second. So to get like GC per second is maybe uh, not. Well, you're only having like one garbage collector for those other cases, right? What's that? There's only like the NGC column. That's number of garbage collections. So there's actually only, it's a very low occurrence event. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if we extend this a little more, uh, what it starts to look like. I guess I should probably do it like this or whatever. One, two, slow right now uh, I guess it's like this there's these these nested uh, tables here okay oh man the R is still hanging on up here but this one is getting real slow and it has no garbage collections right the the, the R version no yeah
I mean, maybe that's why, like, if it has more garbage collection, it, like, is it more memory efficient? Because it's able to clean up the past unused. I think so. Like, memory, yeah. Let's look at this one. Some C has three garbage collections here. I don't know. I don't quite get it, though, because, like, then if you go, like, to the last one, there is only one. Oh, but here it does 19 iterations. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> I certainly don't. But it, but it does. But have, it, it's my hypothesis is that something with the garbage collection slows mm -hmm. it down when it's small, but it helps it out when it's when it's larger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it probably re or like tries to allocate repeatedly, whereas in R, it, it's probably smarter in how it sets it up because it, it has some probably some internal logic on how it's going to do the garbage collection. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, this column is super weird. What is that? I've never seen something look like that. <laughs> is it just like a vector of, like a visualization of a vector? Is it? OK. Can you, is can it, you is hit it... the results dollar sign time? No, it's, I guess it's just the way it's visualizing it. Uh, memory. So it's proportional to the number of iterations, it looks like. Oh, yeah. Bench time. It has, so, so it has the time of every single iteration, right? So it's like a, it's like a bar chart almost? Like it's just <laughs> the, the height of it? Well, it's numeric though. I think it's just, I think it's just like, like broken or something. It's I think really our fine. studio is having trouble with it. Because it's, it's just a, to run on. It's a numeric vector. Yeah, I'm curious I don't if know. we should log a, a bug. <laughs> I know. With our studio's GitHub. I don't, I don't is know. Is it a bug or a feature? At, at first. Okay, yeah, at, I don't know. What do they call it? A pictograph? Yeah, uh, at first I thought it was like skim R, uh, you know, how they have the, the like, uh, the histogram um in the like console output or whatever with like a character yeah. vector mm -hmm. i thought or a character string i thought that's what it was um but it's cracking yeah me. it looks looks like a bug it looks it like a bug in a few different ways yeah. um <laughs> um but uh but yeah cool there's one other thing i wanted to show is just this example uh 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 that um Hadley uh, kind of mentions or references in this. Um, so this guy, this physician, is creating a, like an agent-based model, um, and he does it in R first. Um, and I'm not going to go into like all the details, but I just thought it was interesting to see a real example of like a kind of full start to finish of doing something fully in R and then fully in C plus plus and using data frames and stuff. So. Um, like he's, let's see what exactly the case is. So he's trying to predict the probability of someone choosing to receive a vaccination in a given year. Decision will be based on their age, gender, and whether or not they're infected with the virus. Okay. Um, so they create a cohort. Uh, I guess they're, he's like just kind of randomly sampling from these different variables to create, uh, you know, people and their characteristics. Uh, probability of choosing to be vaccinated. So this is like kind of timely, but I think it came out a long time ago. Oh yeah, July 11th, 2012. Um, okay, probability to be choosing to be vaccinated based on age, their gender, and uh, I don't know what ILY is. So infected the virus last year if they were. Um, and so he does some stuff with like uh, L apply, looping, uh, for loops, uh, D apply, a bunch of different things uh, to, I guess, uh, let's see, create a testable function strategy. So he's taking a cohort data frame as input, calculating the vaccination probability for each member of the cohort, and then returning a data frame with the cohort data plus a new column for the vaccination probability. Okay, so I haven't gone to this in depth, but since it's an agent-based model, I would imagine that each person's probability is somehow also a function of other people like around them somehow or it's 
people that they know. I don't know how that plays out here, but, um, but yeah, but I just thought this was interesting. So he uses this inline function to actually just like write the C++ code, uh, write in R. So you don't, he's not like, like using the source C++ function. Uh, uh, and maybe that, I don't know, maybe that's because, uh, well, he says here, he doesn't, he just doesn't want to do right in the R script. So I, I was thinking originally that maybe it was because he wrote this in 2012 and maybe that was before a lot of these RCPs, but he is calling it right here. So maybe he just refers to do it this way. Um, anyway, so like he's, he's basically taking uh, this data frame that he's, um, uh, uh, you know, defining this data frame. And so there's an example of, using like this data frame object that R from this RC++ uh, module, uh, kind of initializing a column called age, that's a double type, uh, int type for female, and int type for this that prior vaccine or prior infection, I think. Um, creating a, a variable uh, of the size, a probability variable of the size um, of this uh, data frame, uh, the last column. And then uh, kind of iterating through, calling this uh, vaccinate CSX function, and then basically taking all the vectors that he's created here and creating a data frame. And so there's this create, uh, function um, from this RCP CP data frame uh, object. And then, um, and then, yeah, then you just basically create a data frame like this. So you say named and whatever you want your column to be uh, plus all the vectors that you've created. And then you kind of, you know, just wrap it in parentheses and um, you're, you, you're outputting uh, a data frame back into R, which is pretty neat. Um, and so then he, I guess he has a one more function here and then he just calls it from R and, uh, he does some benchmarking and this do RC PP is like, uh, uh, I don't know, 150 times faster. It's pretty neat. So. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was neat that like, like, I think when I was first going through this, I was like, well, these like simple examples are nice, but how do we, uh, kind of interact with the objects that we're usually using in R? And, um, I thought this was just a neat way to show that with, uh, uh, you know, taking these vectors that you've kind of iterated over and, um, creating a data frame object that you can then use in an R session. Yeah, so. I, I could kind of see where this is a good example of where the actual value to this is, which I was lost on kind of reading the chapter, mm -hmm. um, which is like if you have some very kind of bespoke thing that you're trying to solve that you can do with relatively elemental parts, but will be slow. Uh, and you can, if you could take it to another language. Like I've done a lot of, um, a lot of signal processing. Uh, and I mm -hmm. remember my, my, PhD thesis, I'd have to leave my computer running for like hours on end to run all the loops and stuff because we were doing these like really, really large Fourier transforms. Uh, and uh, actually one of my uh, colleagues from then, he has now actually converted most of it to Fortran for that purpose to be linked into, uh, into R. But I could see how you could do that also with C++ like this. Like if you had something that you can't use the base functionality for, and it's going to be faster because you have to code it up yourself. Like here, he had his own um, his own functions, like the the probabilities of function there that he write himself, right? So it could be yeah. Much faster. Yeah. Um, so is this the vaccination probability yeah. here? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I guess if you had functions like that, right? Like you could you could code those up yourself and they might be significantly faster than the alter alternative written in, in R and looped in mm -hmm. R. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
or maybe an example is like if you have a non vectorizable function, like it requires interaction with other elements of the um, of the vector of the data frame, maybe you know there's better ways to do that in C++ because mm -hmm. it can loop faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for sure any, it seems like any time you're writing a for loop in R and it's taking a lot longer than you wanted to, uh, you can probably do it a lot faster in C++. Um, yeah, I feel like if there's like, this would be my last resort. I don't know if anyone else thinks that way, but like <laughs> if I have a loop and I'm like, damn, this is slow, <laughs> I'm going to do a whole bunch of stuff Yeah, and maybe yeah. think about this. Yeah, because I mean, it's it's as much as they have really nice, like convenience functions, you know, this module for C++ where you can do things with data frames uh, in C++, like it is a whole nother language, you know. Um, and just as I was doing this, like, I, I, you know, you don't, it took me two or three hours to get that one script to work that I show you guys because uh, it was just, you just get like, you forget a semicolon and then uh, you like don't know how to do like, I was trying, originally I was trying to do like, like a list of, of, of numeric vectors. Uh, and, and then like, like in base C++, you have to like, in order to, I guess, in order to iterate through a list of objects, you have to like create this like special iterator object and then like use that in your loop. And then um, it just, uh, it just, I, I, it took me forever to kind of troubleshoot and figure out. And that is like kind of a real case where I was, you know, I was unhappy with this unnest function. And I was like, well, let's see if we can make it faster. And um, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's like, you know, too much, like maybe it's, you know, it's just like, cause here, I mean, I feel like there isn't much to, um, to really do differently. You know, he's just like putting a for loop in here and he has a for loop or, you know, or a map or something above, um, you know, like, like there it looks similar except for the, you know, the, the different, you know, ways you define a for loop for instance, but um, I don't know. Anyone else think they would they're going to use C plus plus anytime soon, um, or anything else in the chapter that they wanted to discuss or talk about? Um, it does have me thinking about the places where my coworkers are telling me that code is running for multiple hours at a time. Um, mm. What kind of things are you doing? Uh, just out of curiosity, like that. I don't exactly know, <laughs> uh, but okay. I think it's model. It's model building. Um, I see. Yeah, they're using packages I don't. I don't even know. <laughs> like that I've never even heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, they're doing a lot of prediction stuff. Or from Jake's example, like a few weeks ago, like. I feel that that would be hard, right? Because like a lot of the source code for that is already written in either C++ or I think it was Fortran also, right? What, um, uh, what did I share? I don't remember. No, sorry, not Jake, Josh, Josh. Oh, uh, oh yeah. Uh, right, like like a lot of that stuff is already written in the language and like another language and then like there's like a wrapper, you know, it's, it's so that you can use it in R, but um, like, yeah, that would be a whole nother level of difficulty to like write, rewrite like a, a, a model or something uh, in C++. Yeah, but he actually, you, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so if you had a very bespoke, like a random forest model you're running and you want, it has almost like you know, very little tunability, right? Like I said, I feel like ours big thing is having a lot of functionality. You might be able to make it way faster, right? Cause you could, you know, or a neural net that you built yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it yeah. also has me thinking maybe just garbage collection for my <laughs> <laughs> projects. Um, yeah. Well, right. if it's garbage collection, usually it just means that you're you're not doing a very good job of, of taking care of your variables, right? Or you've sometimes garbage collection can happen with model building because you're storing additional data, like the way the model return structures are, uh, like. Uh, GLM net is really bad for it for like if you have a big model matrix it will just store all the data along with it again and so you end up with these like 
you end up with huge data sets repeating themselves internally into an inside an object. So you you that will kill a lot of stuff that way. So you kind of have to be smart about what you store back. And there's a couple of um, Stack Overflow cases I found where people are like, here's a function to, or here, here are like the four steps you need to do to go inside, like, I don't know if it was GLMnet or another package and cut out all the redundant pieces of code, like pieces of data um, that are being held onto for things you don't actually need to do, write a predictive model. So I wonder if, uh, if um, tidy models does a better job just because they are trying to be relatively lean in the way they do things. So it might be faster, but. I think they are using tidy models. Um, okay. Doing multivariate adaptive regression splines. I don't know. Okay. Whatever that means. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing I mentioned that just reminded me of what you were saying, Josh, is this like pointer thing. So like, like I know a while ago we talked about uh, pointers and like how stuff is stored in memory in an R. But with like C plus plus, you can like directly like reference uh, and like create pointers um, and. I guess if you understand kind of how to work with this, uh, uh, you can like, it's like, I think in, in the tutorial I was reading, they were like, it gives you a lot of power, like and a lot of control over like how your program functions and like what it's doing with memory. But like, you can also like break your, you know, like you just like, you know, you can totally overload your computer if you're, uh, if you don't do it, if you just, you know, if you're you're uh, using memory in a, in a bad way. Um, so I think it kind of has like less guardrails for memory, but more uh, capabilities of optimizing it. Uh, yeah, I watched one video on pointers in C++ and kind of forgot what I learned in it, but um, yeah. But, but yeah, anything else? Um, No, I think you did a great job. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> tried. And thanks for fighting through the weeds of that chapter. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, th I hope it's helpful. And uh, I don't know. I think it's something that maybe we'll we'll connect back on, you know, in the Slack channel, and um, uh, you know, maybe have some examples uh, later on that we can share with each other. Um, I thought some of these these resources at the end were interesting. This, uh, like, especially on algorithms, um, I really haven't read much about algorithms and designing them. And like, uh, it's kind of a computer's area, computer science that I'm just like really unfamiliar with. But I was interested in reading some of these books he mentions. Um, but just an aspiration. So. All right. Um, so yeah, I know a while ago we were saying like Demer Jake, you brought up the idea of like doing a some kind of a project or something at that like to to encompass what we've learned, but uh, I haven't had a lot of time to do that in the last few weeks. So. I don't know. Yeah, I forgot even the example that I was gonna that I was gonna share. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think everybody deserves some congratulations to make it for making it to the end of the book. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, you guys are a great great group to to learn with and uh, to get to know, and um, it's definitely yeah a lot of fun uh, coming each week and. Um, yeah, uh, having these discussions. So. I think yeah, I, I feel like. The... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I appreciate the effort I, everybody put in. Uh, I haven't haven't seen Jorge here, uh, but you know, thanks to him, and uh, also thanks to some of our the past um, people. Who was it? Eric was in there. Abby for a bit. Yep. Uh, a few yep. others. Uh, oh, um, I'm 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 going to. I can't remember the the woman, the Indian woman's name. Um, 
I'm blanking out. Anyway, um, Minoski. Uh, or... Begin with a P. Uh, it was a while. Yeah, it's a while ago. Yeah, it's a while ago. Yeah, it was it was in 2020 when you started. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's um it's definitely a journey through this book, but uh, I don't know. I feel like I've learned a lot and kind of like stepped up a lot of pieces of my our code, or at least uh, like it, the stuff that I haven't gone as much into, like classes, uh, more aware of like what they mean and kind of what the different options are for um you know like especially moving towards like package development and things like that um yeah um, yeah i find classes are i use them more for like pulling things apart or like debugging like, can I, I can understand like oh this is this is the s3 thing i understand how to do all these you know things on it rather than building my own and yeah, that wasn't yeah. exactly his intent, but I felt like that about a lot of the stuff where it's like, I now understand how to interact with all these things mm -hmm. and how to read them if someone else has written them, right? Because mm -hmm. that's a really good point. More my use of R. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the source code isn't scary anymore, um, or at least most of it. Depends on like how it's it written still have for this true yeah i still have like a visceral reaction sometimes like when i'm looking and uh i feel like it's still kind of confusing uh like when you like you know you go to the the source code for a particular function that you want to understand and then like it like creates like a define like constructs the object there but then like you don't really see how it's actually doing the internal thing that you care about and you have to like jump to five different uh files and I've had a lot of cases like that where like I've I've like I thought I've understood like what's on the page that I land on, but it's like so hard to connect it all. So, I don't know yeah. if you know, but if you um, have your cursor in a function name and you hit F2, it'll then show you the source code of that. And you can kind of just keep going mm -hmm. through that to kind of see where all the source code is, is playing out. You can also like go into like debug mode, um, but uh, that was like mm -hmm. new to me. Uh, like a month ago to, to learn. Interesting. Uh, I used to just call the function name without the parentheses. Um, yeah, yeah. You see it. But if you do it with uh, uh, F2, it like opens it in another source tab and then you can kind of see it a little better. Huh. F2. I usually use the view, like to view the, the stuff in the panel. With that, I I usually use the view, like the build, view function. Build. View like V I E D W. View, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. With the function. Yes. Um, so the haven't done that either. Open another tab like F two. Oh, interesting. Do you do it? You do it without the parentheses in the function. Yeah. Ah, okay. yeah. Cool. Yeah, but that—that's essentially the view that uh, that F two should should give. I see. Cool. Did not know that. All right, let me get going. But thanks so much for coordinating and herding us cats towards towards this this finish line. Um, I've, I've really appreciated the group and learning from each of you. So thanks. Yeah, yeah. same here. Same here. Uh, definitely. Yeah, stay active on Slack and keep in touch. And uh, yeah, hope hope we keep posting some stuff and you know keep learning as we apply these things. So. You know, looking forward to staying in, in touch with you guys on, on the Slack cool. channel. Cool. For sure. All right. Thank you for all your uh, thank, thanks to you guys too. Uh, have a good uh, have a good evening and talk soon. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.